I was going um, through my folders. I have tons of information that I collect. And I came across this small little paragraph I want to read to you. Uh, it was sent to me from Center for Arizona Policy. And think of, when I'm reading this, think of where we are today, 2017. This was written in 2009. So it was before all the changes have taken place in the, the laws of the land for marriage. The quote, to quote Time Magazine's cover story this week, no other single force is causing as much measurable hardship in this country as the collapse of marriage. Many times when we see marriage discussed in the media, the reports are disheartening and discouraging. Even this week, we have yet another attack on the Federal Defense of Marriage Act launched by the state of Massachusetts. That was the beginning. That was the beginning of our end, you might say, here in this country. However, for once, it's nice to have a positive article to share from this week's Time Magazine. The article is titled, Is There Hope for the American Marriage? and explains how we as a society have devalued marriage by making it all about fulfilling our own selfish desires and needs instead of about sacrificial love and raising the next generation. And when I, when I read that part, it just reminded me of the Malachi scripture where God hates divorce and he is looking for that next generation to be godly seed. And you can't have that when, when marriages are being destroyed. And they're being destroyed on a daily basis just in our country as, as we speak. As a result, we have a what have you done for me lately mentality that causes so many marriages to end in heartbreaking divorce with absolutely devastating costs to our children. As Time Magazine states, the fundamental question we must ask ourselves at the beginning of the century is this. What is the purpose of marriage? Is it simply an institution that has the capacity to increase the pleasure of the adults who enter into it? Or is marriage an institution that still holds to its old intention, which would be God's intention, and function to raise the next generation, to protect and teach it, to instill in it the habits of conduct and character that will ensure the generation's own safe passage into adult adulthood? So I want to go over some of the things that we spoke about. Some of you weren't here last week, and so it's online, but you've got to do this funky wending your way through the, the internet to try to access it. Until but it repaired. Yeah, it'll be repaired. But I just want to refresh that God is not happy with divorce, but he's not happy with emotional divorce either because it's really the undermining of the family that we, we don't, we don't recognize that emotional divorce is taking place until it's too late and then it just ends up in divorce. And that's Satan's you know, happy little trick that he plays on us. And I wanted to say to you, I didn't mention it last week, that you know, I've, we've painted as a dire picture of where we were. And it was dire, but the unfortunate thing of it was is we didn't know it was dire when we were going through it. So what I want to clarify to you was, if you were to see us at church, you would have thought we were just this wonderful family and wonderful couple. And even at home, like when I went to classes and we got to the emotional divorce part, I, I couldn't admit we were there because I didn't see that we were there. And that's what's so clever and, and horrible about it's almost like a sickness and a, a disease that takes over a family. I would have to say for the 30 years that we were married, we were uh, well suited for one another. We had similar likes and dislikes. We didn't argue about money. We didn't argue about child rearing or anything like that. But we carried our personal baggage into this relationship. I had my baggage and he had his baggage and we didn't know how to sort through that baggage. We carried our temperaments, we carried our spiritual gift, we carried all these things that make up this entire human being into this relationship and we had no tools in which to maneuver and manage ourselves in, in this situation. And here's the thing, here's the thing about Satan. Remember we talked about sinkholes and how uh, you can see a sinkhole in the news and everybody says, oh my gosh, it happened all of a sudden, when in reality it didn't happen all of a sudden. 
and that's where our relationship was, was the sinkhole, and we hadn't quite gotten to the, the uh, cascading of the dirt into a hole. The total collapse. The total collapse of the relationship. But what it was, and this is what I wanted to bring out, was busyness. We were busy raising kids. I was busy driving kids to and from uh, school. We were uh, YOU'd to death, basically. I mean, it was wonderful for our teens in, in the church to have the youth activities that they had, but it was constant activity, constant activity that we were running uh, helter-skelter all, all over the place trying to accommodate kids. Uh, Wayne was speaking, he was leading songs, I was entertaining, we had tons of people to our home. So on the surface, we not only looked good, but for the most part, we were pretty much enjoying our life. We were having people over, we had a large social circle, uh, we went out to dinner, we went dancing, we did a lot of things, but see, here's the thing, I feel like Satan, he peers up from underneath that sinkhole at our life, and he goes, yep, they're busy, so I can get the, the backhoe out, and I can start undermining, and I'm going to dig that dirt out, dig that foundation out, and then, oh, we wake up a little, maybe we read a book or something, I'm rattling his cage, because I'm knowing something inside of me is missing. So then he peers up and it's like, oh, I have to get the shovel out because she's awake and aware and he's awake and aware. But as soon as we'd go back to, I'm driving kids and we're going to dinners and we got the feast and we're, you know, all these activities we were doing, um, we weren't paying attention. We weren't paying attention to the foundation. And, and what I want to remind you also is about the human spirit. It, everything starts in the spirit. It's God, we're gonna have Pentecost tomorrow, and so it's God's spirit that links up with our human spirit is what grows us up internally. He's not gonna grow us up physically. This body's already been set in motion to grow and mature physically. We now have to grow and mature uh, emotionally and mentally, and the, the substance of who we are, which is residing inside what I call this earth suit. Or we talk about this earth suit in terms of being a tent come Feast of Tabernacles time. We talk about a temporary dwelling and it's this tent because what God's trying to grow up is who we are inside. And so, you remember Wayne's Bay? Well, Keith, you'll, Keith, you'll have to <laughs> go see I don't that online. And about the baggie? Not Scott. I, I, I mean, Jason. <laughs> Jason. We're calling you Scott today. <laughs> um, anyways, Wayne had a, a plastic baggie and he put a hundred dollar bill in to give as an example that the baggie isn't what has the value, it's what's inside the baggie that has the value. And we don't tend to look at ourselves this way and, and uh, it's really it's this baggie that wears down and falls apart. We're always putting it together. We're running to the doctor with the chiropractor to put the bones all in alignment and uh, taking pills and medicines and whatever. That doesn't address the human spirit. That just only keeps this, this baggy or this earth, stu earth suit functioning so it can carry who I am around in life. Well, Satan's not after your baggy. He's after the essence of who you are. Your, your spirit, soul, and mind. And so who I am was suffering greatly because I did not feel loved or valued or, or wanted. I mean, these were all the things that I felt internally. And when I would say these things to Wayne, he couldn't understand what in the world I was talking about because he was all about taking care of the earth suit. And, and you can see in society where people are craving love, they're craving to be known, they're struggling with depression, um, all of the things that go on on the inside of you, but people tend to address what's going on in the inside with a physical solution, which usually is, well, I'm gonna gamble to feel better, I'm gonna drink alcohol to feel better, I'm gonna take drugs to feel better, and now pharmaceutical drugs is on the rise with everyone taking these things so that you feel good. But the fact of the matter is that the essence of who you are is not being addressed. 
this is being medicated. This is being, uh, we eat food, we, we gorge ourselves and people, then they have bulimia and then anorexia, trying to, to gorge and then get rid of the food so that it's all about feeling better. But none of that's gonna make who you are inside to feel better. And so we want to um, go on to talk about <coughs> the human spirit and, and how it communicates. And this was the part that we really had to learn and, and think about and really study and understand because God, there are scriptures in the Bible, we went over the scriptures last week about this, the human spirit and it's throughout the whole Bible. And um, I'm not gonna go back over those scriptures, but there's a quote that I wanted to read here. It says, our capacity and this is where we were lacking. We had an earth suit to earth suit relationship and we were busy earth suits. We were running around doing all kinds of stuff. And myself, who I was inside and I couldn't explain to him why I felt lonely, why I was depressed, why I felt empty. I mean, all of these words that I was trying to express, he didn't get, he didn't understand because he was not functioning emotionally. As a woman, God made me to be relational, and I am emotional, and he was, and he'll explain that in a little bit here, trying to shut me down because he didn't know how to take care of those emotions. But it's so important to understand this because we're supposed to be having spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationships. It's like uh, when you come into a room of people we start out the conversation on a very earth suit surface level. What do you do? How many children do you have? Them, you know, so forth and so on. But if you do that week after week after week, you're not getting, you're not getting in there. You're not getting deep. And so it has a tendency to make you feel um, that you don't know the person and then they don't know me type of a thing. And, um, but I wanna read this uh, quote, our capacity to have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God, who is spirit, is actually demonstrated by whether or not we are capable of having a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with other human beings, and marriage is the most demanding testing ground for spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationships in this world. And that's the absolute truth. This is, this is the uh, area that God is training us in so that we then can have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with you and then take it further than that when you have the resurrection of people coming you know, to live their life again on planet Earth, how are we gonna relate to them? They, they're coming with all their baggage, all of the things that had gone on in their life, they're being resurrected with that stuff. I'm not talking about people who are converted, I'm talking about those who are not. And so we have to know how to be able to address people in those situations. And if we can't do it here, I'm not gonna be able to do it here and ultimately further on up the road. This is the testing ground right here. Where right. We can have a, a spirit to spirit relationship with each other, right. which is the closest relationship. If we struggle here, there's no way we can have a, relation, a spirit to spirit relationship with anybody else or with God. You know, we can do a lot of religion but that's not, that's not really what God is looking for. He's looking for a relationship, which is a spirit to spirit. Um, yeah, I can experience. do a lot of list of do's and don'ts, but that's really what this baggie is doing is the list of do's and don'ts. Um, God is looking for a relationship where I'm meeting him at that place. And I didn't understand any of this. This was like a foreign language to my brain because I'd never heard anything like this. And um, I, I was thinking about how words matter. We were talking about how words matter, how we use a word like, well, I'm going to church, because when we say the word church, we immediately picture a building, whether it's a Sabbath church or a Sunday church or whatever, whether it's got a cross, it doesn't have a cross, I'm going to church. And immediately in our mind, I'm going to this place, when in reality, God is, says the church is us. We're the church, we're the ecclesia. So words matter. And so we were talking about spiritual. If you are a spirit, you know, and you're human, the essence of who you are is spirit and that we're supposed to be having a spiritual relationship, we tend to look at the word spiritual entirely different. Like we would say, 
the Pope is the spiritual leader of millions of Catholics in the world. So we look at the word spiritual, meaning a particular way of looking at that, or, oh, she's so spiritual because what? I mean, she raises her hand in praise and worship, or she's so spiritual, or he's so spiritual because he's memorized the entire Bible or something like that. When in reality, I'm a spirit inside of me, inside of my earth suit, and that's what's being affected. And that's, what a, he, that's how he affected me for years, because he was not hurting my earth suit. He was taking care of that. I had shoes, and I traveled, and I ate well. But he was hurting who I am by uh, never accepting who I was, I never accepting my temperament. We were so different that way. He's a phlegmatic, and I'm a choleric. And he was constantly trying to change me and make me into him instead of Which helping right. me. Yeah. Yes, his viewpoint <laughs> of himself was right, and I was wrong. And so we had to learn all of these things. So he's going to uh, go on to talk about how the human spirit communicates, how we communicate, how we could recognize that in each other. Yeah, when I first uh, started taking these classes some 20 years ago, and I heard them talking about us having a human spirit, to me it sounded like heresy because I'd never heard it before. And, you know, even the truth, when you first hear it, sounds like heresy because it's, you never heard it before. And, you know, how do you, how they, how do you know they know what they're talking about? And, uh, and I, I felt the same way myself when I first found out about the Sabbath and the you're, Holy Days. You're backing into the... Or any of that stuff. And so I had to be taught what, what it means to have a human spirit. And so it was a, like a six-week class so I'm gonna, we're going to try to go through some of that so you can at least get a, a, a glimpse of, of what, it, what we're talking about. The human spirit is what, is what makes us who we are, like she was explaining. And that's what God is looking for. He's, he's looking to resurrect and to make spirit beings into our human spirit, which is who we are. But we've, we've not been taught about it. We don't know how it exists, how, how do you even recognize it. And so we had to learn uh, how to recognize what the spirit looks like because our human spirit doesn't have a voice uh, So God has designed a way that the that the human spirit can be recognized It's kind of like the wind when the wind blows you can't see the wind But you can see the effects of the wind you can see the trees the, the leaves blowing in the wind and that kind of thing So, you know, there's something going on well the same thing goes with human beings when God made man he made the human face to be the voice of the human spirit. Our, vo our, our faces make unbelievable different uh, contortions, contortions. <laughs> when, we are th when our, when our uh, spirit is affected inside, it comes right out on our face. So our faces are kind of like the trees that are blowing in the wind. And, and a man has to learn how to recognize that. Now the wives know, the women know, because they're so relation, relational, they'll walk into a room and they can see a, another lady's face and know exactly what's going on in that person without even asking any questions. They'll know that there's something going on. Well, a man doesn't recognize that at all because we've never been taught that. And so we had to go through class to find out how to look at our wife's face and, and, and to see what her face is doing because that would tell us there's something going on internally without her even saying a word. Because, you know, as men, we don't focus on, on the faces, we focus on words. You know, my wife's face could be so wrinkled up uh, in, a, in a horrible state of, of panic, and if I asked her what's wrong and she said nothing. Well, that's how you used to be. Yeah, I would say, oh, okay, she's good to go, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm not watching her face, I'm just hearing the words. And so, as men, we have to learn how to do that. We've got a handout here. We're gonna show you what those faces look like. Okay, I'm gonna turn my thing off so I'm not like... Okay. Okay. I think you'll be amazed at how many different faces the human face can make. And there's no other creature that God has made that has a face that can do what the human face can do. You know, and God could have made it so that 
our face has never changed, just like a snake or uh, you know, any of the animals you see out there that have a face, they, they don't have any expressions at all on their face. But a human has many, many, many different phases of, uh, of looks that they can have. And we, we'll just take a little bit to go through this so that you can see what we're talking about. I wanted to put this on the screen, but I can't do it because of copyright laws, but we can walk through this. Let's look at the first one. Let's, now, as you look at these, I want you to look at the actual fa the, the eyes, on what the eyes are doing and what the mouth is doing on each one of this. I mean, look at e the word exhausted. I mean, you can take one look at that without even saying anything and know exactly what's on the face, just because of the, what the face is doing. And you look at confused, again, the eye, you know, one's high, a little bit higher than the other. Ecstatic, I mean, they're all teeth. Uh, look at the one guilty. I mean, that's an amazing one. Look at the, what the eyes are doing. Look at what the mouth looks like. I mean, it's so obvious what the human spirit is, is, is doing with these kind of facial expressions. Look at suspicious. I mean, it's just, it tells a story by just looking at it. Look at angry. I mean, you can look at somebody and know what's going on in their human spirit just by the facial uh, description there. You got a hysterical going on. You got frustrated. Again, look at the eyes. Look at the, the brow. Look at the forehead, the wrinkles that go on. I mean, that is telling a story by just looking at a face. Uh, look at sad. Again, look at the eyes. Uh, confident, big smile, uh, embarrassed. Happy, I mean, we all know what happy looks like. We see a lot of that. The mischievous. Now, mischievous looks uh, kind of like anger does, but it's different, isn't it? It's got a different look in the eye. You can tell with the, frown, the, the, the brow frowning. Uh, disgusted, uh, frightened, and enraged. Look at enraged, and then go up and look what angry looks like. You'd think they both would look the same, but they, they're different, aren't they? The enraged, look at the eyes. Look at where the mouth is, the teeth. Now these are things that we were taught to look at when we were looking at our wives. Look at uh, the word ashamed and, and cautious and smug. Well, we've seen smug faces, haven't we? People that are very arrogant and self-assured, they walk around with that face. Depressed, again, look at the eyes. Overwhelmed, hopeful, you know, the eyes are looking up, got a smile on their face, and look at lonely. Again, the eyes and, and the, how the brow is formed. Look at love struck. Oh man, we're all love struck when we're out chasing our girlfriends, aren't we? This is the look on our face. Uh, we, they can do no wrong. Jealous, bored, surprised, anxious, shocked. And look at, the, look at shy. I mean, that one is pretty obvious, too. The eyes are real close together. There's no mouth movement at all. So what I had to do after this class is that they gave the men an assignment, and I'd like to pass on the assignment to you guys that are sitting here as well, is that when you go home, I want you to look at your wife. Look at her wife. Look, look at her eyes. See her lips. What, the, what her lips are doing when she's talking to you, or even when you just walk in the house, because you don't, she doesn't even have to say anything. Just look at her eyes, and you can tell, once you get trained on this, exactly what is going on in her human spirit. You know, it's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. So you can, you can read, yeah. you can read a person's right. demeanor, what's going on inside by what's going on in the face. So when I'd come home from work and I'd say, uh, how, how is your day today? I could see her face, once I'm trained to see it, that, there, that it was not a good day, but she would say, fine. You know, I used to just hear the word fine and say, ah, okay, she's fine. good, I don't have to get involved in this. <laughs> but now she can't trick me anymore, because I know I'm on to her, because I've been trained <laughs> to watch her face, so that I can question her now when, when I see something that's going on, and, and I, I can see something's bothering her, and I question her, and I can tell by her face whether she's gonna tell me 
what she's going to say. In other words, I'm not going to pay any attention to the words I'm looking at her face. Well, in the past, he would say, how was your day or is there something bothering you? Well, I didn't want to divulge anything because I didn't feel safe. And so I'd say nothing, nothing. And he used to just go, well, oh, okay, nothing. Nothing's great, you know, and he'd yeah. go on. And I felt very hurt because for some reason, I expected him to, to know, and yeah. he didn't know. He, he didn't understand uh, any of that. Another woman would know, but right. a man is obl oblivious. Well, that. we'd walk into restaurants, and I could scan the restaurant. Every woman does this. We can scan the restaurant. You can see, oh, that, that, they're dating because they're all, you know, they're, they're, they're in ecstasy, in ecstasy and, yeah. you know, uh, the hunt. <laughs> is going on over there or we can see someone's having a problem or they're bored or whatever is going on you can see it you can yeah. see it and we were just at dinner when we were down in mexico and we were at a restaurant and this couple walked in and they sat down oh boy now there would have been years ago wayne wouldn't have paid any attention but he was the one that called it to my attention he goes wow there's something going on at that table because <laughs> she's really icy and and when i looked over it was like oh yeah and but, I felt so bad for the guy because you yes. could tell he was totally confused. He didn't know what to do. He was just fumbling with himself. He was trying to hold her hand. Yeah, and, and of she course, just was looking off she was, like. Mm -mm. And oh boy, did she! What, <laughs> what look did she have on her face? Well, she had a little enraged there for sure. And uh, she was just icy cold. Oh, icy yeah, cold. Icy cold. I mean, it was just crazy what was going on. <laughs> But this is only half the, the problem men have, is that they, they, they're not trained to look at their wife's face and see what's going on and question what's going on in their face. The other part of it, if you change the, if you turn the page over, this, this is about emotions. And this is what's called the emotional starter kit. Now, most men do not function in any of this. I mean, I had, when I saw this list, I couldn't believe that there was that many emotions. As a man, I had maybe four. I was either angry, I was happy, I was sad, or I was neutral. I had nothing going on. I mean, that was it. That's basically the only emotions I ever felt. So when I looked at this, I thought, that can't be. There can't be that many emotions that's going on in here. So God had to teach me how to feel emotions because I didn't have any feelings. You know, as a man, we're shut down from just an early age as young boys were taught, you know, don't cry, you know, suck it up, kid. You know, they were, they were trying to toughen us up. So our, our emotions were shut down. So we don't feel basically hardly anything unless it's really traumatic. And so for me, for, for me, God had to teach me as a man not only to look at her face so I could see what's going on in her spirit, but he also had to teach me what feelings feel like. Because, I, you know, that's foreign to a man. He doesn't really have feelings. It's, it's, I know the lady's looking at us like, how can that be? But every man out here knows that feelings are just not something that most men can relate to. Let me just say that when they passed this list out when we were in class, I looked at it and I refused to mark it and answer it. I couldn't go there because when I looked at it, in my mind, I had only felt all the negative feelings and that was horrifying to me because see, here we were living that life, that busy, busy life and I didn't want to admit that we were on the precipice of total and complete disaster and so if I mark this, I would then have to recognize that all the feelings I was feeling, they weren't the happy ones. They were all the sad ones. So I refused to do it. And I have my workbook from four years. And every year, the first year is completely blank. I refused to even do it. And, and it distressed me inside of my spirit. It distressed my soul. And it was like some, I, I had shared this, this uh, example once before it was like somebody had stuck a piece of wood in an old uh, bog you know the the old marsh and the bog where you see it in movies where it's all green and crusty and so it was like somebody had stuck this wood in that bog and it was now beginning to crack and they were moving it around and I was quite content even though I had prayed for so many years for God to rescue me I was actually quite content 
to stay where I was at because it was familiar and safe. And so now they're like, stir in that stew pot. And I was like, well, I'm not going there. And so I didn't, I didn't fill it out. But the years thereafter, I began to fill it out. And, and, and this was one thing I want to just interject here because I didn't say it in the beginning. It's really hard for me to come and speak about this because it, I have to go find this girl that's 20 years ago. I got to go find her, and I'm not her anymore. And I have to go find this girl, and I have to literally resurrect her up, and I have to feel all those feelings that I had felt so that I can express that to you and, and help you to understand where I was and how I got there. And so when I have to go back, it's, it's almost traumatizing to me to some mm -hmm. degree because I have to go remember and I have to feel that again. And I'm not, to give you hope, uh, like David Antion said today, to give you hope, it's like I was there, but I'm not there anymore. I've got to go back every time I do this and go find her. We have to we discuss it. And sometimes it brings up old emotions and it's like, and it makes me cry about that person that I was. But I'm not there anymore. I'm over here. And I haven't been there in 20 years because Wayne took seriously what we'd been taught and he applied it. Was it easy? No. And uh, it wasn't easy for me either. But it was like we forged on, we, we believed that it was the truth and we applied it and it made a huge difference in our life. So I just wanted to say that I didn't fill this out the first year because I wasn't going to go there. Well, I had to learn how to feel. And so God, because if I don't learn how to feel, then, then I'm going to be continually hurting my wife because I was saying things that are very hurtful. Well, he, and, I, and I'm not even knowing I'm being hurt. Well, he never hurt me physically, but he sure was stomping all over what was with inside words. of me with words. Right. So God being faithful, he had to teach me how to feel. And so this was 20 years ago, but I got a call from my minister one time and he said, I want you to come over to the house. I got something I want to talk to you about. So right away I, I got, Ooh, what's this about? I mean, he's my authority. He's over me and he wants to talk to me. What, right away my mind is spinning one trying to figure out, well, what did I do? So I get to the house, his house, and goes to the back room, and we sit down in his office, and I'm sitting there, I felt like a little kid, you know, in front of us. You know, <laughs> what's going to happen here? <laughs> and he says, I just want to talk to you. He says, I don't like your sermonettes. I don't like the way you do your sermonettes. I says, well, what, why? What, what, what am I doing? He says, I don't like the way, I don't like your style. I don't like the way you're, you use personal examples in your life on things that you're overcoming. And using that as a story in your sermon is, I don't like that. He says, I don't want you to do that anymore. People don't come to church, they hear what you're struggling with. And he says, besides that, he says, you are, you're looked at as one of the pillars in the church and people don't want to be you standing up there talking about how you struggle with things. You're supposed to be the example. So you're, I don't want you doing that anymore. And I, I, I didn't even know what to say at that point. And so then he goes on and he says, you know what? Another thing. He says, you're trying to unsurp the sermon when, you're, when you speak. I says, I'm trying to unsurp this. What do you mean by that? You're trying to get the limelight on yourself instead of just warming up the audience for the main message, which was supposed to be the sermon. So you're not supposed to be talking about any of this stuff, so you're, you need to stop that. I don't want you doing that anymore. You, you speak at, at my request. I can have you jerked off the schedule any time I want, because I have the authority to do that. He says, I want you speaking the way I want you to speak, which is I want you to do a, a, a difficult scripture and use two or three verses and that's it. He says, I don't want you saying anything of any, any value, or I mean, he didn't say value, but anything that has any real meat to it. He said, the meat is for the sermon. And so I don't want you to stop that. I don't want you doing that anymore. And if you don't stop, then I'll have you removed. And you know, I, I left there 
uh, in shock. I didn't know what to even say or do. It was like he just crushed me. And so I got home and my wife asked me, well, how did, how did it go today? You know, how did it go? <laughs> I said, well, it didn't go real well. I said, uh, I feel like I've been kicked in the stomach. And she says, well, uh, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. I says, well, I, I just, for a man, you know, I'm trying to explain what just happened and put it in words. It's like I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so she says, well, pull out that emotional starter kit. Let's look at it and see if you can find something on there that you, maybe you can relate to. And uh, I had one here that I had already checked. Let me see if I can find I got Oh, here it is. So I started looking at that, and I went down the list, and I said, okay, well, I felt angry. So I checked angry, and I went down some more, and, and I, I said, okay, I, I certainly felt dejected. He, he just told, you know, made me feel that for sure, and, and then he, he made me feel depressed, and then, and then over here, he made me feel disappointed, you know, like I wasn't doing a good job and, and then he went down and, and uh, I went down and I saw frustrated he made me feel frustrated because I, I didn't know what to do about this and then I went over to to hurt he certainly made me feel hurt and, and then I went over and I, I felt rejected and then I felt resentful and then I felt wounded and I was absolutely shocked that all this was in here but I couldn't put any words to it because I'm a man. All, all I could feel was pain in my chest, felt like, like somebody had kicked me in the stomach. And so I had to put words to my feelings. And that's the first time I had ever done that. And it was a real eye-opener to me. So going through that, it made me feel all these things. And so my, my wife asked me, she says, well, how did that make you feel when he did this to you? I said, well, it just, it just, you know, just crushed me and it made me feel all of these things. He didn't like feeling them. I didn't like feeling them. Yeah. He was, he'd hidden and buried yeah. himself. And then my wife said this to me. She says, you know what? You have made me feel every one of these things. And, and the things that you have said to me over the years, you've made me feel every one of these things that you checked. And she said, how did that make you feel? because that's how you made me feel. And when I sat there and thought about that, I thought, holy cow, man, I have, I have made you feel that way because of what came out of my mouth? Because of words that I have said to you? I, I was absolutely devastated that I had made her feel like she was kicked in the stomach and all these other things. Because God had to take me to somebody who was above me in authority in order for the, him to affect me in that way. Well, our wives come to us because they look to us as their authority as well. We're over them. And so what we say and what comes out of our mouth is so important that we be careful what we say and how we say it to our wives because we make them feel things that we never felt. You know, so it, it's something that I had to learn. And so when I get into conversations with my wife, I have to be very careful what comes out of my mouth because I'm still learning that I have to be careful because they're, they're so relational that they take it so personally that it just crushes them. And so I'm learning how to do that. Well, he was being criticized on a style. This is his style of yeah. speaking. It's his way of delivering a message. And someone in authority over him wasn't appreciating his style. Well, it was a good lesson. And this is all God, this is how God does it. He takes that physical activity and he slams it into the spirit so yeah. that you can get the spiritual concept yeah. that God's trying to teach us. But in all that, in all the time prior to going to uh, classes and learning all of this, um, he never liked my style. He didn't like me being choleric. He didn't like my spiritual gifting. He didn't like uh, certain things I designed or painted or I mean anything and everything that I did. 
It was about style. You I didn't, didn't like, like her hairstyle. You liked I my didn't hair. like her dress because mm -hmm. she wasn't looking like he thought. I thought she should look like being I am a deacon in the church and she shouldn't be wearing things that look so outlandish in bright colors <laughs> and and messy hair. And he likes smooth hair. I like hair. smooth hair. She's always liked this kind of hair. <laughs> Wild and tossed and because that's who she is. But you know, but so I was trying to mold her into something. The same thing the minister tried to do to me. I don't want you speaking like you speak. I want you to speak like I we, speak, I like speak, speak in a way we were taught to speak here. And you will follow this outline, and if you don't do it, off with the head. Well, I was doing the same thing to her. <laughs> and I couldn't explain to him how hurtful that was to me. And he just saw it purely from a mechanical, physical point of view. He, he didn't know I had a human spirit, so yeah. he was like tromping all over it. And, and the essence of who I was, all my talents, all of the, the things that God had given me in life and, and trained me in, and my spiritual gifting and my temperament, and I mean, all of it, he didn't like. And so that left me with the feeling, he doesn't like me. Mm. So what do I do with somebody who says he loves me, but he doesn't like me? And so I then proceeded to try to change myself. And that didn't work because, uh, then you're not true to yourself. You're not true to the, the person that God created you to be. And it's very dissatisfying. And this is where these addictions come from. This is how, why people are medicating themselves because of all the stuff that goes on inside of them from the time they're a child to the time they get to be an adult. This stuff is going on and seeping out on the outside. And people are trying to medicate that and do happy, happy things. I mean, you can only have so many clothes and eat so many meals and drink so many drinks. And it will never solve the, this problem about who we are internally. Well, I thought I'd learned my lesson and I was good to go on. You know, hey, I got this under my belt. Got it. <laughs> well, a couple of years later, uh, we had a, another, I don't know why it always has to do with ministers, but I guess it has to, it, because they're an authority. So. Had, you, you respected their work. I respected what they had to say. Well, I, I had another little run-in with another minister and a new guy in town. And he was having some problems in the congregation. People were not liking him. He wasn't communicating. He, his sermons were dry, boring, and, and people were leaving because he was just... He, the guy should have never been a minister. He was one of these guys that had hands laid on him right out of college. He should have been something else, but not a minister. He had no people skills. It was, I felt sorry for the guy because he was really a nice guy. He was just in a square peg in a round hole. And anyway, the, the deacons got together and they said, you know, we got to do something with this guy. We got to help him out here because if, if he continues the way he's going, doing, he's going to chase everybody out of the congregation. So they asked me, I don't know why me, but he had, they asked me, would you be our voice for us? Would you take him aside and gently tell him what's going on so that we can maybe salvage this? So I invited the guy over to the house and, and he was all happy to see me and wanted to know, you know what I w wanted to talk about. And so I said, you know, what I'm going to say is very hard for me, and I don't, I, I don't want it to be hard. I, I'm here because I, I want to help. I don't want to be part of the problem. I, I, you know, you've told us, deacons, that we are the eyes and the ears of the congregation, and when you hear something, you want us to come to you and tell you what you're hearing and seeing. So I'm, I'm doing exactly that today. And so I proceeded to tell him, you know, that, that the people weren't too happy with the way he did his sermons and they, they didn't think he was personable and a few things like that. And I could see his face change from Mr. Happy to, <laughs> I mean, ooh, there was some pretty bad faces going on here. I thought, oh man, I'm in deep doo-doo right now. I don't know what's going to happen to me. So anyway, he... I saw what was coming, and he laid out. He says, you know what? He says, you're, you're only one periscope, he said. I have a lot of people that like my sermons. I have a lot of people that like what I do. And I, you know, and, and I think you're listening to the wrong people. And in fact, I think you're part of the problem. 
You know, you're the one that's causing this. You're the one that's churning this up. And he stomped out of the house and took me off the speaking schedule, took me off the sermons. I mean, he, he burned the messenger. So anyway, my, uh, after that meeting, again, I went to my wife. <laughs> I says, man, that did not go well. The handy dandy emotional <laughs> starter kit. <laughs> I says, man, he just tore into me and I feel horrible. He says, well, how's that make you feel? I says, oh, you know, where's my list? Oh, yeah, I get my list out again. So I go through the list. She says, how did that make you feel when an authority did this to you? I says, well, I, I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed because I came to him with an open heart, a, a, a right heart, and as he turned on me, I felt betrayed. I feel that he sacrificed me to protect his own ego. I felt that my opinion had no value because it wasn't logical in his mind. It was no value at all. And after a very shallow apology, he tried to convince me that I was the problem. And when I told Claudia that, you know, what did she say? You have done the very same thing to me. You've made, you've, done, you've made me feel the same way. You've made me feel betrayed. I, because I came to you with an open heart and a hand and asked you to help me. And instead of me helping, you helping me, you betrayed me. Mm -hmm. Because you let me down. You came after me. You sacrificed me to protect your own ego. How many times I have done that to my wife, I can't even count. That I have, I have, I have uh, sacrificed her to protect my ego so that she wouldn't make me feel bad. She says, you have made my, my uh, opinion have no value either. And how many times did my wife come to me with an opinion, and because I didn't agree with it, and I couldn't see it from my own mind, my male mind, that I discredited her. And it was like the dollar bill thing we did here the, a couple of sessions ago. I refused to go on her side of the dollar bill and see what her perspective was. And there was times when I did a very shallow apology as well, when I <clears throat> tried to be righteous, you know, and say, well, Jim, I'm sorry I did that to you. But it was shallow. It was shallow because he was just sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. With, and I, he didn't understand. He never understood what it felt like. But it, God then became faithful to me in helping him to understand what things felt like. And that's the value of yeah. faces. And then I've tried many times and have made reversed the tables when she's come to me. <laughs> and made it feel like it was, she was the problem. Oh yeah. Oh, many, many times. I was an expert at that, to be able to turn it around and make her feel like it was her problem. If you were just more converted, <laughs> if you just did this more, and if you just did that more, I would have a whole different reaction. And I put the whole blame back on her shoulders. I mean, it's just, you know, looking back now, it embarrasses me because it was, it was so shameful. Here, I'm supposed to be the Christ-like leader in our, uh, in our family. I'm supposed to mirror Christ as a leader. And I wasn't doing that. I was destroying the family because of my ego, because of my pride, because of ignorance, because of not knowing how to look at her face and read her face on, on how not knowing what feelings felt like. And so I had to do a whole 180 degree turn in our marriage and take marriage counseling or marriage training seriously. Because I, the way I was going with what I knew, I was destroying our relationship, destroying the relationship with my children. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I got one more short story about justice, remember? Yeah, go ahead. This was again 15 or so 20 years ago. There was a, a, fam a famous football player, he was called the Boz. I don't know if you remember him, but he, famous football player, and he used to cut, uh, these, shave. these shave these lines in the side of his head right here, across, and that was the craze. Every kid wanted to have that. Well, my son 
came home one day and had that on the side of his head. I tell you what, I went ballistic. How could you come home? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to tell the people at church that, you know, I'm a deacon and I'm supposed to be a leader and you come walking in here with your head shaved like that? I said, you, you're embarrassing me. This is a shame. I mean, I just read, of course, he cried and ran in the bedroom, you know. And, and again, I, I felt righteous in my indignation that he had done something like that. And years went by. Well, and I had said to and, him. And you, you did. I said, it's just a style. Styles come and go, yeah. hair grows, it's no big deal. But you're making this huge issue. But again, it was only his perspective yeah. mattered. Nobody else's perspective mattered. And he wouldn't hear me. Yeah. Well, years later, when I learned how, what I had done to my son. Well, I had, God gave you an opportunity. Yeah. Another one of these wonderful, <laughs> how does it feel, yeah. opportunities. And where so, he had to feel something. Right. And so, because of that, I, I felt I needed to go back and repair with my son, who I had just crushed. You know, it was probably 10 years had gone by, and I, I just felt really I had to go repair that. And so I took my son aside, and I said, you remember when that happened? He said, yeah, I remember. I said, I just want to tell you, I was, I'm, I'm so ashamed of myself. I should not have done that. I am so sorry that I did that to you. I was totally wrong. And I, if you can find it in your heart to forgive me, would you please forgive me for doing that to you? Well, he was very gracious, you know. He said, yeah, Daddy, come on, Dad, it's no big deal. It was a big deal. I needed to repair for that. And, and that's another thing that, that we have to do as husbands. Once we learn how to do this stuff, we have to go back to our wives. Because they're holding on to a bunch of stuff that they've stuffed under the carpet for years and years and years. Now the carpet's got our, such a big our carpet lump in it. Huge, <laughs> it was, huge you couldn't lump. walk around it. It was so big. I've had to go back, and that's how you re we were able to restore our, our relationship. I had to go back and, and repair those things that I had done, the damage that I had done. But I couldn't do that until I'd learned these things because I couldn't feel it. I well, didn't realize even what I was doing. Well, it's, it's not like he was this mean, horrible person. He was just uneducated and ignorant yeah. of all of this stuff. I mean, yeah. and, I, and I don't Pretty mean much. that in a bad way. It's yeah. just <laughs> it, on a relationship level, on a yeah. marriage level, he, there was no example. There was not the right teaching. And so, hence, we just thought we could be married and, and live our life and, and be live busy. Live happily ever after. Be busy, busy, busy. Yeah. And so, <laughs> in the meantime, Satan's, you know, making a sinkhole. Yeah. And it, it was just not his fault. It's not any of your faults. Not any of our fault. We just don't know. We're, yeah. We come up in a world and it's already going. <laughs> and yeah. it's not going so well. God says my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. And that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we've not been trained. Nobody's ever taken the time, at least in the areas that I've lived in, to really go into the depth of what is required in a marriage relationship. What is the responsibility of a wife? What's the responsibility of the husband? What's it mean to be a Christ-like leader in your, in your family? You know, I just didn't know any of that. And so I've had to go back and learn it. But I have to say that once we've learned it and I apply what we've learned, it's, it's changed our life. I mean, we, we enjoy each other now. I mean, we're retired. I live with her 24 hours a day, seven <laughs> days a week. And I like her. I enjoy her now. But there was 15, 20 years ago, I, I didn't even want to come home from work. You know, it's like, oh, I got to listen to that bag again. You know, blah, 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 blah. Please, Christ, return. <laughs> Quick. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> So here we are 20 years later, and, and we, we're repaired, but we had to learn these things to, and, and apply it in our life. Look, we're, we're way past where we, we need to be right now. But, so we need to cut it off again. We've run out of time, but we've got, you know, can you believe it? We're about halfway through our series. So we've, we've had five, and I'm not sure how many more. My wife's health has not been real good, but we're going to try to keep going here. I hope you guys are enjoying this. You're learning from it. We want to keep sharing this with you as, as we get the opportunity to. And so. And, and what we're sharing here is just 
like this subject would take weeks of discussion, weeks of in-depth discussion. We're just giving you that yeah, overview, tip the, the tip of the iceberg overview, but it, it's so important, this subject of the human spirit. It yeah. really, really is. Okay, so thanks for coming again.